So what we're right. seeing here, see. see the edge of the trees right the way around? Yes. If you just take your eyes in a wee bit, can you see the stone, the little stone piles everywhere? Yes. It looks like just like stones on the ground, but that yes. is all buildings. Right round here. So this side of the river, we've got the footings, but the stones aren't so apparent here because they were nicked to build that. So there's buildings all dotted all the way around the wood here. Right, And that's Bob Lear. Bob Lear is a lost township. Tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Allapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Allapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Balblair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots, reimagined moments in Highland history, which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 8 The Clearance Elizabeth Ritchie! Elizabeth Ritchie? No, not in my list. Mackenzie? Lots of them. Duncan? Duncan Bain? Got you! We know this as Clachan, uh -huh. and that was originally Ballin the Iklish, so that's oh. village of the church. The church yeah. And that church goes back to 1200. This was the big one. The archaeologists are telling us this was a medieval city. Mm -hmm. Could have been a thousand people living here in medieval times. Crikey! Yeah, it was very, very important. We've got 86 buildings just on this lady's field. 86? 86. And it's unknown. It was unknown. Because when this I start... presumably includes houses and outbuildings and so on, yep. your structures. Yep. 86 structures. Yes, 86 rectangular structures. And there's still stuff in the wood that I'm finding. And Dulca Biggin will be empty the morn's morn. If I, Hugh Ross, officer of the sheriff, do my work well the day. My name is Professor Sir Tom Devine, University of Edinburgh. You've got to understand that there were two phases of clearance. The first is called, you know, the first phase, which is really relocating people to the coastlands from the interior glens in order to, in quote marks, encourage them to take part in fishing or kelp manufacture. Then from that period down to the clearance we're talking about, there was a sharp contraction of almost all of these activities. Everything from soldier recruitment, big problems in kelping, significant problems in the herring fishery. And at the same time, of course, the population was still growing, despite the fact that it had been leakage through emigration. It was like a kind of contracting vice. Income employment was being reduced, but the population was still rising. And the rentals demanded by the landowners were still operating at the same high level they had done in the late 18th century. That's nae business of mine, what they do or where they go. That's for others to concern themselves with. I have my orders. Through the sheriff doon from Mr George Stuart Mackenzie himself. The lands at Inverlaw mun be evacuated, cleared for progress and the general good, this very day, 15th day of March, 1820. Now, there was 77 families evicted out here, 55 in 1819, then they come back and they got another 22 in 1820, and that was the Glen Dead then. Alexander Urquhart, Ishbel Urquhart, sons Erchie and Stuart, Dr. Mary, you've had fair warning. You know what might happen. Open up. Inverlaw removals take place exactly in the time of gathering difficulty. Rent arrears almost certainly would have been increasing. Therefore, the landlord, Ingham, would be affected. It became almost a consensus among the elites of the Western Highlands that only sheep farming after the Napoleonic Wars would, would really pay. Mr Urquhart, this has all been negotiated. Notice was pinned to the church door. The taxman, the factor, the minister, we've all had our say. Arrangements have been made for you, all of you. This is not my doing, Alec. You can that fine. I'm only doing what's asked of me. Come now. A new life waits for you. All of you. Ishbal, 
Molly. So what was this cleared for? For sheep? All cleared for sheep. Yeah, they could get more rent from the the flock musters than they could get from the poor people. Well, and especially in an area like this where it must have been so highly cultivated and fertile. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got all your aries up there. Yeah. Beautiful hill pasture. Yeah. That has been manured for yeah. what a thousand plus years. Yeah, and you can still see it green up there. Bet you can. Many of the farms in the vicinity, including Inverlale, had been taken out of lease. That's a classic sign of the landowner preparing for removal because he could argue to the sheriff court that these people weren't paying rental and had no legal right to be on the land. So the serving of the summonses of removal was a straightforward way of ejecting them. Come now, you can find you must. You have no legal right in this house any more. What we do have is the list of names that were presented with eviction notices in the two phases of the eviction. We also know down to the detail of who wasn't in the earlier eviction because there's a note at the bottom of the eviction notices being put through the door. One of the things about the summons of removal is it has to be delivered legally to the individuals who are going to receive it. So overwhelmingly, the people of Inverlale did receive the summons directly from the visiting sheriff officers. But in a few cases, the door was not answered, as the report has it. And so in that case, they pushed the summons of removal into the keyholes so that legally that had been served. And here I am, back again, on the date stated. We know there was a Anne Munro, a William Fraser, a Marjorie McDougall and an Isabel Mackenzie from Inverlall and a Alexander Urquhart from Bull Blair and the summons were left in the keyholes of the doors after striking a door six times and no admittance was gained. And the sheriff officers could then return if people had not moved by the due date and remove them in a coercive way. If there was any reaction to that, if there was any protest in it, any violence to the sheriff officers, then the police and the military would move in. You have received the summons. Everything has been done legal and to the letter. Come along, Alec. Do you really want the soldiers breaking down this door? Find yourself and your family in front of the courts? Eventually, let there be nae doubt. Prison? I think they would potentially have an element of compassion, but I think they would see their job. It's just something they have to do. I wouldn't paint them as evil people with no feeling, but at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily say that they were overly emotional about the situation. They probably felt quite a lot of sympathy for them, but they would have understand what their job role was, and they were only there to do a job. We're all the acquaintances, Alec. Ishbel and my Katrina, mothers together. This is for your own good, I'm sure of that. There's a fine life ahead of you all. In a sense, it's a tragedy what was going on, a, a kind of inevitable tragedy rather than fact, if you like, the pernicious intervention of heartless and greedy landowners. They themselves were in great difficulty. Of course, they were much more affluent than the people and they could look forward to a better life than the people, but the experience they were going through in terms of economic crisis meant that the, the old bonds, the old attitudes between people and landowners were beginning to disintegrate. You come in here, you know, while well, I've been here since years, here. but looking at the buildings, imagining the roofs and then the smoke. Yeah. And kids laughing. Yeah. Dogs barking. There's another, another dike just down there all the way down the oh, river. Yes. So that would, again, keep the cows out from heading down that way, I presume. That's our cobbled area there. Which is facing south? south? South, yep. So on the warm days, you'd take your spinning wheel out there. Yeah. You would take your, I suppose your washing you'd be doing down in the burn. Mm -hmm. And the bridge is it that's All optimum. your food prep you'd take out onto your cobbled area and get a few, as many rays of sunshine as you could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rightly or wrongly, the law was almost entirely on the side of the landowner because in Scots law, of course, and indeed in English law as well, landowners let land to tenants. If tenants weren't able to pay their rental, then they were legally liable for removal. 
It was a, unfortunately a straightforward situation in terms of the capitalist system of the time. We know that some of them went to Ullapool. Ullapool was only about 40 years old at that point, so there would have been a lot of opportunity for them to set up at Ullapool. We know some of them went to Lake Mill because we then have records of them being cleared again another 50 years later by the Piri evictions. We know there is a number that moved to the lock side. There are local stories of them being camped out over the winter next to the glebe at Clacken before they were then given land at Letters, Arndrain and all the small wee townships that span the lock side. Good morning, Ishpal. You're hopped up fine for the journey. I've got the two sets on my paternal side, my father's side. My mother's side is Sky um, Ullapal. But on the paternal side, so both sets evicted from here, settled uh, in the one place at Altamushkin. So they settled briefly there. They made the hovels. I remember saying to my grandfather, what happened to the old ones? They died. So then the next spring, they moved down and they settled at Letters and at Art and Drain and they built the two houses. Cabafé and what's now known as Cherry Bank. One thing which is important to remember is, is the memory of clearance. Many of them are actually not only not recorded, but not remembered. Some of them are remembered, but they're not recorded. Uh, they're remembered in, if you like, the tradition of the people. Often that tends to occur when parts of the population don't actually, who are about to be, if you, if you like, removed, Sections of the population of the township, which are not about to remove, live on in the surrounding areas. For example, we know that some members of the community of Inverleil settled at least temporarily in Ullapool. That's a, that's a general pattern. If there is a town or a village nearby, often in the first instance, the evictees will, will go for that area and settle at least for a period. And that sometimes then generates a memory of what had gone on in the locality. Anne Munro. Personally, I feel that the legacy that we can see now is just a vacuum. Up until the start of this project, Envelo was not a story that was particularly known locally. There was one or two people who were aware of there being some form of settlement there. But the story of that settlement has not been passed down in the same way that the clearances of other villages has. I mean, we've got ones that are, are quite close, even the Lake Melm ones are still within Loch Broom. There is a huge local passion and scar from when the Piri evictions took place that does not seem to be there for the Inverlo ones. It's almost as if the community just forgot about it. Apart from one or two key interested families where it came down through the family, but there's not a community memory of it. William Fraser. Ach, poor Willie. And the weird thing is, you know, I was always waiting for someone else to do this project. And I was, because it was always, and my grandfather was always lecturing me about it. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, you be sure and tell the history. Be sure and tell the history. He's b evicted us. And da, da, da. Yes, yes, yes. And then I went to the museum and I asked them about the ball blair. They hadn't heard of it. So I thought, gee whiz, I've got to do something to this. So that kicked it off. And here we are, three, four years later. A day's work done. Katrina will have bros in the fire by now. If ere I return to this place, it'll be gone. Invisible, like salt and sauce. Only the breeze, the trees, and a few stains. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the experts were Professor Sir Tom Devine, Siobhan Beetson and Duncan Mackenzie. The writer was Chris Dolan and the actor was Hamish MacDonald. Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund.